Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the concluding part of our first series of shows about Romania in World War II. And I hope you've been enjoying, I'll say enjoying is a tough word because we have covered the Holocaust and some of the rather nastier side of things. But today uh, we are looking at the occupation of Transnistria. And when I started planning these shows, um, well, it's more well, well over a month ago, I had no idea how topical this subject would become. But that's just why the the unfortunate side effects of where we are now and the current affairs. But this is an interesting show because it's it's about the only uh, non-German occupation of a territory of the Soviet Union, the Romanian re reward for their role in Operation Barbarossa that, of course, Grant talked about extensively yesterday. So my guest today, Vladimir Solanari, is a doctor of history. He's currently teaching and working in Florida in the USA, but he has taught and 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 received education at various places, Moldova, Russia. He's spoken at the United States Holocaust Memorial. It, he, you name it, he has done it. And he is currently working on a new book about Romania. The link to the book we're discussing tonight is in the description below. It's about the occupation of Transnistria. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Vladimir in. So, good evening or good afternoon. How are you today? Uh, hello, sir. I, I'm very good. How are you doing? Very Thank well. you for having me. So let's explain where we are first, Vladimir. Mm -hmm. So he here we are. Uh, we are talking uh, about this territory to the east of the Nister River and up to the southern Bug rivers. There are two rivers which are called Bug in Eastern Europe. One is to northern Bug and another is southern Bug. So we are talking about southern. It's a territory which is um, a part of today's Ukraine mostly although there is little sliver of land, uh, of land on the eastern bank of the Dniester River, which actually belongs to Transnistria and now comprises um, a breakaway region of Prinistrovia. Uh, now this area is almost in the focus of our attention. The um, battle is going here, um, are going here battles, uh, here uh, heavy fighting. Uh, around the city of Nikolaev, and um, Russians certainly want to take Odessa. So all of this is this region in the focus of our attention again. But um, the book is about World War II, and it's an about uh, uh, Romanian occupation of this area. Romanian called it Transnistria, meaning the area beyond the Nister River. Uh, oh, can we a little change it? Because, uh, yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, go back, go back, please. Can you book? Okay. Um, uh, beyond the Nister River to the east of Nister River. And this is the area which administratively didn't exist before uh, the Romanian occupation. It was created by the occupiers. Um, so it comprised uh, most of the Odessa region here, part of the Vinitsa region here, and also part of the Nikolaev region of the Ukrainian SSR before that. Um, uh, so why devoting a book to this area and to the Romanian occupation? There are many reasons to this, basically because of part and a tragic part of the history of Ukraine and also of Odessa. Um, it's also the place where Romanians um, deported up to 250,000, um, well, maybe a little less, but still up to 200,000 Jews from um, Bessarabia. This is Bukovina, also part of Romania. Also intend a lot of local Jews. So it was a place of heavy suffering of the Jewish population. And now also Roma, part of Roma, Romanian Roma was deported in this area. So this area served as a dumping ground for the Romanian racial undesirables, if you um, allow me to use uh, the language of the occupiers themselves. Okay, and so um, uh, what makes this area special? It, it was basically the only area in the former Soviet Union which was occupied during uh, World War II by the power other than uh, Germany. There was a very small part of the Russian territory in the North was occupied by Finland, but the area is so small, basically it's like, Tens, ten of southern people live there. Uh, here, 
uh, we have area uh, whose population number between 2,300,000 and 2,500,000 people. So it's a considerable uh, piece of land, 40,000 square kilometers. And uh, the most important city was uh, and is Odessa. It's an important uh, metropolis, uh, commercial center with the rich cultural history and cultural life. Now, the question arises, why is this special arrangement between Germany and Romania while Germany agreed to this occupation? And the story is a little kind of fuzzy. Um, the first Hitler offered to the Romanian dictator Antonescu, as he put it, to take as much territory in the East as you want. It happened um, before the um, start of the Barbarossa operation on the 11th of June in Munich when the two guys met. Um, but Hitler probably meant oh, oh, taking as much as Romanians wanted after the war. Uh, Antonescu either misunderstood it or misinterpreted, reinterpreted this meaning and insisted that Romanians would occupy this area even during the war. Uh, and Hitler eventually agreed because he needed uh, Romanian participation in the war. Initially, he was kind of skeptical about the fighting abilities of, of Romanians, but eventually he realized Germany simply didn't have enough troops to police these enormous areas in the east. And so he needed Romanian troops, if not actually for real fighting, but at least in the auxiliary troops somewhere. Romanians were involved in fighting, but it was not their primary role. The primary laws was to police and to fight partisan groups. So uh, this area, um, the German army, the army didn't like this idea that an area of the USSR would be given Romanians as a kind of um, compensation for their war efforts. But Hitler took this decision sim uh, single-handedly. And as a result, Romanians established their own administration in that area. So the study of this area is also interesting as a kind of a comparison to the developments in other parts of the uh, URSS occupied where the Germans were the masters. Now, uh, my book deals with a number of issues. First, the aims of the Romanian occupation, the, the ways they administered this territory, or the, the ways they understood their role there, and also how um, local population, not Jewish population. I left this subject of the persecution of Jews out, not because I don't I don't think it is an important one, actually for quite, quite the opposite, I think it's the central um, uh, aspect of this story. But I left it out for another book on which, which I'm now working on and I hope to be able to send it to the publisher by the end of this year. Now, um, uh, so um, reactions of the local population who were not Jewish or were not subject to the immediate internment and extermination like the Jews were, uh, how those developments, uh, how those relations developed over time. And so if you allow me uh, to go through all of these subjects uh, very briefly, I would start with the aims. And um, here um, the situation was kind of a little blurry because Romanians wanted to occupy this territory and they wanted to annex it, but uh, they were wary of declaring the annexation of the territory forever. Um, you see, there is a difference between occupation. Occupation is a temporary affair and annexation is kind of forever. And they were afraid to make this declaration because they thought that Hungarians who uh, uh, re-annexed what was known as Northern Transylvania or Ardau, right, in 1940, with Germany's support, would present the annexation of Transnistria as compensation, territorial compensation for the north, loss of Northern Transylvania. But Northern Transylvania was absolutely central for the Romanian nationalistic imagination. Public opinion was adamantly um, in favor of the return of this territory and the government proclaimed it its priority. That was one of the contradictions in Romanian policy. So they, they decided not to declare its annexation, Transnistrian annexation until the end of the war, priority being the return of Transylvania. Now this contradictory position 
of Romanian authorities uh, led to the fact that um, they wanted to annex Transnistria, but didn't want to declare it. Nevertheless, Antonescu gave an order to the uh, governor of this area to run it. Um, the governor was Georgi Alexianu, who was also a professor of administrative law, to run it as if it, uh, it was uh, R Romanian territory for thousands of years. Uh, so that was the idea. But the immediate aims were some, somewhat different. The first priority was to use Transnistria as uh, an economic asset, to support Romanians' war efforts. The second um, kind of idea was um, to uh, prepare its um, annexation after the war by changing the ethnic makeup of the population so they wanted to expel all Slavs and import ethnic Romanians from the rest of the Soviet Union. They even started doing something like this, but then because of um, the need to concentrate resources on the war, they abandoned these efforts and nothing came out of it other than uh, that the local non-Romanian population was provoked by those uh, ill-conceived efforts to um, import ethnic Romanians into Transnistria during the war. Now, uh, and finally, there was an effort to Romanize the population by uh, making local Slavs kind of Romanians, teaching them Romanian language, educating them in the Romanian spirit. So the Romanian policy was contradictory and um, um, and, and um, and um, also um, kind of they acted at loggerheads with each other, different authorities pursued different aims simultaneously. But eventually the priority became pumping out resources uh, from Transnistria. This was the most important priority, even from the beginning, because in 1941 it so happened, the harvest in Romania was bad, food, provisioning in various uh, parts of Romania was below the norm. They had also to deliver foods to Germany, according to the agreements with Germany. So in Transnistria, however, the harvest was good. And so they decided to take as much as they could from Transnistria, pump all resources to keep population in Romania happy. Now they thought of it probably as a temporary measure because they took so much that the population was upset. They promised that that would be temporary measure. In the next year, they would leave um, one half of the local produce to the population. But 42 came. Uh, it was also a difficult year. Uh, there were already defeats on the battlegrounds, and Romanians basically, Bolins, Nolens, by, by design or by the default, decided to pump out more resources than they could. And that already was provoking a lot of uh, indignation and um, uh, resistance to the, on the part of the local population. But then in 43, when they realized that the war's um, trajectory turned and the front was approaching, that they will probably abandon the area, they decided to dismantle and to send to Romania uh, all kinds of um, uh, economic industrial assets, including factories, plants, tractors. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes. Okay. Plants, factories, anything they could put their hands on. They called it Operation 1111. And of course, the very side of them uh, taking, uh, dismantling the equipment, the installation, anything they could find, tractors, uh, trams from Odessa, etc. Uh, upset the local population even more, provoke a lot of um, concerns, worries, and indignation, and in fact, increasing hatred of the occupiers. And this just constitutes a big part of my book and my research, because what they found out, the attitudes towards the occupiers changed over time. That initially local uh, Christian population welcomed them. You need to understand two things here. First, that, uh, of course, Soviet rule in Ukraine was incredibly oppressive. It was oppressive all over the Soviet Union, but Ukraine suffered 
particularly heavily during um, the so-called Holodomor. I hope uh, that the listeners know this word. It became kind of um, infamous recently. It's uh, the massive famine following the collectivization of Soviet agriculture in 32-33, which caused Ukraine up to 4 million people dead, dead in the famine. A famine, a famine was um, um, everywhere in the Soviet Union, but in Ukraine it was particularly heavy uh, for reasons that should not detain us here. And of course the memory of this horrific experience was still very much alive, but then um, the famine was followed by a period of the increasing Stalinist repression known as the Great Terror, when people were arrested and killed for no reason at all, just to fulfill the government approved quarters of arrests and executions. And so all of this weighed heavily on uh, the memory of the local population. So was there was uh, understandably little laugh lost between the Soviets and, and, and the Ukrainians from the area. But there was another uh, reason for, for that um, pro-Romanian feelings um, and initially at the beginning of the occupation for German pro Romanian, because those who remained in the area were basically self-selecting group. People had the chance if they were kind of pro-Soviet and supported the Soviet regime to um, evacuate to the East. Soviets pro provided, not to everybody, depending on the situation, but such opportunities existed all over the area, right? Uh, and for example, the family of my dad uh, emigrated. My dad was, uh, my granddad was in the uh, Red Army, but his family decided to, emig to evacuate to the, to, the, to the east and they ended up beyond the Volga River. Right, that's how far they went, and then they returned after the area was liberated. But you can imagine that those who stayed stayed for a reason. <laughs> they mm -hmm. stayed because they were particularly anti-Soviet. And so Romanians noted how pro-Romanian these feelings were, and how benevolent the population was. And now, what Romanians, when they stayed there, they created these different agencies that monitors what they called the moods of the population. What they realized that the moods initially were very pro-Romanian, anti-Soviet. Local population had the occupiers to hunt down, arrest, and eliminate terrorist groups with the party and the Red Army created with the aim of conducting sabotage activities in the occupied territories before leaving this territory. So they had helped them hunt down those groups. And the groups were actually very ineffectual despite a lot of resources invested in the creation of, of them and equipping them with necessary activity, uh, material, material. But uh, as the time went on, the mood started to change. And increasingly, the occupiers found out that people were joining resistant groups. Some of them were forming uh, under the influence of the Soviet propaganda, but some of those kind of autonomous groups, people didn't like what they saw. And um, uh, the groups were creating here and there in different parts of, of the region. Uh, people were taking to the woods, right, and uh, taking arms. And by 1943, the partisan activity became a serious problem for Armenians, in, especially in the northern areas, which were more forested than the rest. Transnistria is very little forest, a little forest, and forest actually is a natural habitat for the guerrilla groups. Nevertheless, they did form there. Romanians were initially su uh, uh, successful in capturing them, but increasingly, the resistance became more and more active. And it presented a serious problem for the Romanians. When in November 43, Germans came and eventually Romanians left the area in, in February uh, 40, but by, by basically by March 40, 40, 44. Um, when they left uh, and Romanians took, Germans took off, they found out this already the quite extensive partisan uh, guerrillas that they fought. And damage responded by repressions. Romanians were repressing. They, they arrested people, suspected partisans, and then they, they murdered them without trial. They hanged them. Uh, they sometimes um, uh, put on fire the whole villages in the midst of winter. People living their livelihoods, 
all right? So repression was severe. But then the Germans came, what the local population experienced under the Germans was an absolute horror, right? Germans responded by much harsher repressions. And uh, eventually when they were withdrawing, people were attacking them from behind. So it was basically the attitude of the population changed to the opposite. Uh, you can imagine how much Romanians and Germans had to try to uh, achieve this change of the attitude of the local population. However, there is a caveat. Um, uh, see, what I was talking about up until now was mostly about the local classes, uh, which were basically farmers, most of them, Ukrainians, uh, and say the uh, laborers in the cities whose salaries was very low whose unemployment grew to the extent that Romanians were destroying all of those industrial installations. But there was a part of the population which remained committed to the Romanians and liked them to the very end. This was the creative intelligence in the metropolis of Odessa. They had a lot of reasons not to like the Soviets, but Romanians adopted patronizing attitudes toward them. Unlike Germans, they loved the university to resume its activities. They were proud that the uh, opera and ballet, um, Odessa Theater was back um, staging different productions. The uh, theater was very popular among Romanians. Officials, uh, Antonescu himself was telling his ministers, this is the best opera, much better than they have in Romania itself. And uh, Germans were visiting it. Uh, Odessa cultural life was very rich during the time. Uh, and um, this patronage uh, was local intelligence, uh, what lasted to the very, the very end of the occupied regime. So for that reason, and also because um, Romanians kind of allowed free trade in Odessa, which Germans never allowed in the Soviet uh, territories, um, Odessa was, um, had some kind of economic activity going on during this time, especially in the black market. Um, uh, which, which, which the richer people like these artists, uh, creative intelligence, had access to some good, right? Uh, so this romance continued, and this myth of Odessa's uh, cultural and economic revival survived in the emigre cycles, which people people left with Romanian and German troops, those who were uh, successful in fleeing, not many of them fled. So it's another aspect of this memory of the war and the outcome of the war. But the great majority of the population lost any um, good feelings that they had initially to, to the occupiers. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in with a question now, Vladimir, because it yeah, was a great introduction. So one of the themes that came up with, with Dr. Harwood yesterday is when Western historians talk about Romania in the uh, Eastern Front, it kind of starts with Barbarossa. They they start with the, the big offensive and they don't cover this period before. And you've taken us right back to the famine of the early 1930s. You've talked about the Soviet Union. So as someone who's coming at this from the angle of a Romanian who's lived in Moldova and studied in, in Russia, it, it, it's obviously very important to you that people understand that 20 year backstory before you get to 1941 because that lot that long history is very important to understanding the wartime aspect is that is that your take on it yeah i i really think so and that's some of it i covered in my uh, my book it's not the focus but this is the problem you don't really know much about the history of um, this interwar period in this because unfortunately the Odessa very rich municipal archive was destroyed during the war. I think the Soviets destroyed it, but all of the blame the occupiers, right? And it was lost irretrievably. Uh, so we don't know much about what was really going on, although some we do know through other archives which were not lost. Um, but it, this work still needs to be done. However, some of the published materials from the Odessa KGB archive show how extensive the repression in Odessa was, and how many people, famous people, uh, were actually uh, victims, if not of outright executions and of arrest, of torture, of uh, heavy-handed investigations, of uh, intimidation by 
the predecessor of the KGB and KGB called at the time. And of course, this uh, experience carried out into the period of occupation. Many of our uh, adjacent scientists, uh, artists, journalists, writers, they were happy to see occupation. They experienced a period of this limited but still freedom of expression that they didn't have under the Soviet. And there were a lot of newspapers created by or allowed to be uh, created uh, by the local people, by, by, by the local authorities, by the Romanian occupiers. They allowed these newspapers to circulate. There was this lively cultural life. People were publishing their uh, reminiscences about the life under the Soviet right? Some of them were kind of storied, um, cliched uh, propaganda stuff, but some really were talking about the real stuff. And of course, um, unfortunately, we don't have much memories by the people from the lower classes who were largely semi-literate, right? Uh, but even what you have shows how much resentment against the Soviets there was at the time of the occupation. And this very much is at odds with the official Soviet narrative of everybody being against the occupiers, everybody uh, wanting to fight for the, for, uh, the Soviet motherland, etc., etc. I didn't find much of the evidence, of it, but I did find the changing attitudes, right? It's a different narrative from the one that the Soviet knew. And, and in fact, even the population of Odessa still lives within this kind of um, official narrative space, right? The memory of the war still created by the monuments of the Soviet era, by the museums of the Soviet era. I was surprised to find it in Odessa. So the local people largely unaware of what was going at the time. It's still historians who need to produce this. Well, now in the war, of course, they are thinking about different uh different aspect that's that's a very uh, uh, for some, something that i never expected mm. a, this war that is currently raging in ukraine and that's that weighs heavily on me too right of course. Obviously, on everybody i was but since i am kind of from the area my, my family is from the area in various parts of ukraine uh while well, you can imagine what one one feels it's really thinking of odessa this is a lovely city which i like is being on the verge of invasion, they made the street fighting and destruction. Wow. No, definitely. It's it's these place names we're saying should be only in the past in terms of wars. It's it's horrible to think that the same places we're talking about are facing the same kind of wars and the same kind of hatred, the same kind of prejudice. And but shall we move through, through some of your images, imagery, Vladimir? Because you've okay. reminded me of it. so um you, you tell me when to move on and we'll have a look at some of the images and we'll yeah, and let you kind of just tell some of your stories and some of your, your research as we go along. So I'll, I'll hand back to you. Um, so here we see the picture of uh, Marshal Antonescu uh, talking to the um, commander, German commander, General um, uh, uh, sorry, um, can you um, can you read I forget names. I forget names as well. Don't worry about it. Uh, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, uh, commander of the Eleventh Army, who was the main army operating on uh, the, the Romanian sector of the front, right? And uh, that's the moment when uh, they were very happy to fight together. It's forty-one. Let us go further. Right. Hang on. Ah, uh, Schobert von uh, Roth. Rod, Rod okay. This is the second in command in the Romanian government at the time, who was a distant relative of the Romanian dictator Ion Antonescu, whose last name was also Antonescu. Uh, he was Mihai Antonescu. He was the vice chairman of the Council of Ministers, that also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Propaganda during most of the time. Really, uh, right. Um, hand man and also kind of pack totem in the admin, um, administration of the on Antonescu. Uh, he was also professor of um, international law at the University of Bucharest before the war. Um, he was a lawyer, practicing lawyer as well. 
Uh, what's surprising in Barsky's career that nothing in the 20s and 30s would presage his um, evolution and becoming a convinced uh, anti-Semite as he appeared in, uh, in 1941 when he made one of the most horrible declarations in the Council of Ministers saying that uh, this was a great moment for Romania to get rid of the Jews, if need be, use machine guns. So, wow. And that was the time when they really machine gunning uh, civilian population in Besarat de Bukhavi later in France. So this is machine blotted out. And this was the uh, phrase which then was countless times uh, mentioned, uh, quoted. There is now uh, the Romanian film, which is very good film, dealing with the memory of the persecution of the Romanian Jews by the Romanian government during World War II, and which is um, exactly has the title, this same phrase. Um, I don't care if you will enter into history as barbarians, if need be, use machine guns. Wow. Uh, that's the absolutely horrendous phrase. It's basically uh, kind of proscribes his memory in him for ages and ages, right? Let us move further on. This is a very interesting um, uh, picture which comes from uh, Romanian National Archives, and this is, says Romanian army enters Odessa October 16th, 1941. It uh, talks, or uh, this picture talks to itself. I would like to uh, draw attention to the helmets of these people. You see these helmets are actually French model, <laughs> you recognize. Romanian army was created largely by the French advisors during the interwar period. And um, it has um, the organization uh, of uh, modeled after the French, many French officers uh, started in, in France, including Antonescu himself. The helmets were this Romanian uh, French, uh, French uh, style, but uh, then they fought alongside the Germany. Uh, what a great change of um, tack, right, during this mm. war, accomplished by uh, Antonescu, who prized himself before the war as a Francophile. And wow. then after the fall of France, he said, well, this is the reality. Now we need to align ourselves with, with Germany. What kind of um, consistency are we have there here? This is the Romanian army on the move. And we see here how much it was still horse drawn, right? How little uh, mechanization it experienced. Uh, that was um, characteristic not only of um, Romanian army. In fact, Germans during the population Barbarossa is also mostly horse-drawn army, right? Um, mechanization would come, in fact, during the war, and the Red Army became heavily mechanized, due, but basically due to the land lease. It happened after '42 with the massive arrival of uh, munitions from from America, especially uh, trucks, which was so important to make it more mobile force. Here in the 1941, we still see an army almost kind of resembling the army from World War I rather than mm. from World War II. Okay, let us move further. Again, another picture, um, very well-known propaganda picture. This picture was taken by the um, Department of Propaganda of the Romanian Army. We see here Romanian uh, infantry entering other services, their heavy faces, etc. However, you know, the heavy, uh, the losses of Romania uh, under this were very heavy. They lost more than 11,000 dead, and uh, um, the general losses, including those wounded and uh, uh, how that's called, uh, the uh, uh, OAs, right? Yeah. Right. The right eval. Right eval. Right. Uh, that's, uh, without knowledge disappeared. Right. Uh, we're close to sixty thousand. It was a very heavy loss. It actually shook Romanian society. Romania was a small country at the time. Right. And um, obviously those losses were just horrendous. Okay. Let us move further. Here we see um, uh, one of the uh, ethnic German villages. In Transnistria, the irony of the situation was that uh, there were uh, ethnic German settlements 
in the, in the Soviet Union, in Ukraine, and further to the east. Um, and Germans were aware of it, and their intention was during the war to Nazify them, to, they, to re-educate them in the Nazi spirit, to create them real Nazis. And then if they use them as the outpost of the German power in uh, Ukraine, it was the initial plan. And eventually they just evacuated them when they understood that they were 10, the title was 10. And we see here this village of Elsass, that's how it was called. It's actually close to Odessa. Now, in Transnistria, so it happened that the majority of the ethnic Germans um, in the territories that Germany occupied uh, were concentrated in, in, in Transnistria. <laughs> so under the control of Romanians, but most, and, um, and Germans insisted that they should have self rule. Um, they were provided with better material conditions, lesser taxes, special uh, police force actually who became in some areas of Transnistria, the most devoted killers of Jews under the leadership of the SS. And also, given that they had these um, better material conditions and um, paid uh, lower taxes, um, they were allowed to, they also were allowed to bring their products to Odessa. They were in a um, position to do so, so because they had some surplus of products that is disposal, they brought to Odessa and they sold them. That was one of the reasons why uh, Odessa um, uh, markets were full of products, mostly brought by this part of the population, but more, uh, more privileged ethnic Germans. Let us move further on, please. Um, this is um, uh, uh, this is the symmetry uh, of Odessa soldiers uh, who fought and were killed on that the, the, uh, the village of Pavlovka. They, they were buried there. Romanian policy was not to bring dead bodies to Romania, the first of all, but to bury them in the battlefields where they were. Obviously, this uh, symmetry would not survive through the Soviet era. Of course. Okay. Here we see uh, the um, wife of the dictator. Maria Antonescu distributing uh, gifts to the wounded soldiers. Maria Antonescu uh, presided over the main philanthropic um, organization um, called uh, Council of Patronage. Um, and, um, well, one of the uh, very dirty secrets of this organization was that they used the proceeds from the Jewish properties in order to finance this philanthropic organization. And also some of the resources pumped out from Transnistria were channeled to it as a gifts to the president and they used it to distribute those gifts to the wounded soldiers. Yeah, this is the picture taken by the um, uh, Army Division of Propaganda, the Department of Propaganda we see. Soviet prisoners of war, this huge columns taken, okay? Uh, we know that uh, in the first year of the war, a lot of Soviet citizens surrendered um, to uh, the Germans as well as to Romanians. Um, and uh, it, they were close to 3 million. Uh, maybe as many of them perished during this war in the concentration camp. The story, which is not particularly well known. This is a picture which shows the celebration um, in the city when the crowd assembled in front of the um, German embassy. This is German embassy and the German ambassador, uh, Baron von Killinger, addressing the uh, jubilant crowd about the fall of Odessa. So it's a celebration of the Brotherhood in arms. But what surprises here that the crowd is not particularly big. <laughs> So uh, people were, of course, happy that the Odessa fell, but Odessa, uh, Odessa fell, but Odessa fell only after Romanians asked for the German support. The initial idea was that they would be able to take the city by themselves. It would be the major price for their war effort. But in fact, they could not do it until the Germans intervened and sent their Luftwaffe sources to bombard Soviet 
position. Even then, uh, Soviets evacuated Odessa not so much because of the Romanian pressure, but due to the worsening situation in Crimea, where they felt that they would be cut off um, from their supply bases by the sea in the Crimea fell. And so they decided to withdraw troops through, the, through Crimea in order to continue fighting there and surrender to Odessa. Um, this is the very interesting pavilion um, devoted to, to Transnistria. There was a special exhibition of 42, uh, which was the exhibition on Transnistria. And this particular column here, right, had an inscription which said approximately like this, the new life is being built in the East. And this is the idea which is very and very central to the Romanian imagination that East somehow was this cultural desert, Eastern Europe, and we will bring European civilization there, and um, we will kind of act there as the bearers of culture. In fact, however, when they came to Odessa, they saw the remnants of the cultural life, and I, I would say remnants because, of course, during the Soviet time, Odessa was heavily repressed, there's some creative intelligence, but they still preserve a lot of this remnants of the golden age of Odessa, which was all before uh, World War One. Odessa was a cultural, um, flourishing economic cultural um, metropolis with the um, multi-ethnic population, huge German, Greek, um, as, uh, Jewish communities there, right? And um, they were very much impressed by the cultural literature of Odessa. Okay, let's go further. And would you agree, Vladimir, that it's this period, this when you said at the beginning about the fact that initially the Romanian advances into these territories were received with, with warmth and gratitude, is this the part of the story that's sort of slowly being lost uh, in the narrative? In the Soviet narrative, it was lost, sure. Romanians kind of probably remembered it. But of course, during the communist time, this memory was also suppressed. So it probably mm -hmm. survived in the families, the families who all died. But of course, what Romanians didn't want to remember and still don't want to remember is the story of oppression, in particular persecution of Jews. There's horrible reprisals in Odessa, killings of tens of thousands and in other places, right? And that's something that they never wanted to know. And the film that I mentioned rather Judith, Judith uh, rather Jude, uh, Jude in Romania, right? Um, Jude means actually judge. It's not Jewish name. He is not Jew ethnically Jewish, this guy, but it's a very interesting film, very touching, exploring the problems of how you talk to Romanian society about the crimes committed by um, Romanian state against the Jews to the society which doesn't want to know the truth. Mm. Right? This is the picture which is also very telling and very interesting in one of the um, festive events. And that is, as we see here in the center, uh, mit, mit, Metropolitan of the Romanian uh, Orthodox Church, Vistarion Guru, who actually headed the Romanian um, uh, Christian mission in Odessa with the aim of re-Christianizing, re, re the population, right? Uh, Romanians did preside a call of um, um, religious revival after the repression of the Soviet era, but it was, of course, very short. <laughs> By the time the population realized the Soviets were returning, they stopped uh, frequenting the churches, right? But to the um, left of um, uh, this metropolitan there stands um, the governor, Alexiano, and to the right of him there stays, um, state, uh, uh, stays the um, mayor of Odessa, um, Georgi Puntia. Alexiano uh, was sly, soulless, heartless um, opportunist. Um, he if he didn't actually order the execution, just he turned another way from the persecution, from the murder of Jews, from the suffering of civilians, and let the army who, and the secret uh, information service, special service information, as they were called, right, um, um, to 
organized the persecution of Muslims. Gendarmes participated in this, right? Printer, however, was a nicer guy. He protested on two major occasions. One time, even presenting his um, request for a resignation to uh, Antonescu, but Antonescu didn't accept him. We just uh, remained in the position of the mayor. He helped several Jews, uh, maybe up to 200, he claimed, after the war to escape persecution. So he was not uh, the bad guy. However, the mayor's office was known as very corrupt. It is not clear whether Pinker himself was corrupt. Maybe not. But many of his people who were put in the position of the way credibly corrupt. And um, that, of course, punished his reputation. However, those guys were not the same. And had Pinter in the position of uh, Alexander, he might have prevented some of the worst successes of the Romanian rules against the Jews. Although, of course, much of it depended on the actions of the military and gendarmerie, which was like the um, rural police, who when kind of theoretically under the control of the governor, but maybe acting on their own volition. Okay. Let's move further. That's a nice picture, isn't it? We have here in the background this magnificent Odessa uh, Opera and Ballet Theatre, one of the gems of the uh, Odessa um, cultural life. We see clean streets, and here a uh, Romanian police policeman standing as is, 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 is the very symbol of order, cleanliness, and civilization that Romanians claim that they brought to Odessa. That is more far gone. Uh, here we see uh, the announcements published in uh, Odessa newspapers, uh, which demonstrate how rich cultural uh, life was in Odessa. The he, he announcement are uh, in Russian and in Romanian, and even some of them are in German, I think. No, I don't see here in German. No, I don't think in German. We shall see probably the next slide. Okay. Here we see Antoniescu talking to the man whom I don't know how to identify. Oh no, here is Antoniescu, right? Uh, in the foyer of the uh, Adesan, Adesan theater, he frequented and he liked uh, this opera. And here we see uh, the signs on the streets, uh, which actually shows the performances in the Odessa theaters, Odessa uh, theater of opera and ballet uh, was not the only one. There were many others. We shall see some of the slides in, in, in a minute. And we see here Madame Butterfly. It's Puccini's opera. And we see here also um, Aida, it's Verdi. And we see here uh, also uh, Tchaikovsky ballet, um, uh, Swan's Lake. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, one of the most um, beloved artists, uh, actor, Vronsky in Odessa. Um, he had his own uh, private theater before World War One, then immigrated to Romania and created his own troupe there, performing in Russian. Uh, everybody liked it. Then he returned to Odessa and performed there, <laughs> then immigrated back. Okay. Let's go further. That's a very interesting street uh, picture. It shows one of the boulevards in Odessa. And we see here a sign which is written with Cyrillics, but the, the name of this particular, whatever there is, salon, maybe beauty salon, whatever, is called uh, Romania, written in uh, Russian Cyrillics, but with a mistake. <laughs> ah. Yeah, it's really, really funny. Let's go further. And the girls, see, this is another street shows girls, uh, maybe hookers, right? Romanian officers, soldiers, kind of peaceful life on the Desert Boulevard during this time. Isn't it interesting? Seeing well, I just want to jump in and talk about that because, again, I, you know, I'm English. My understanding of the Eastern Front is mostly by from books written by English uh, American authors, David Glantz, Prit Buttar, uh, David Stahl, who's New Zealand, of course. But 
when I think of the Romanian involvement in the Eastern Front, I'm very much thinking of Barbarossa and then up to Stalingrad. I'm thinking of combat and brutality and lots of lots of death. And this is not what I think of when I think of the Romanian uh, push in the Eastern Front. These photos of, of of Odessa. So it's for some reason that, that that this part of the story, as I said earlier, seems to have been a bit dropped from the narrative. See, Odessa was famous for many reasons. One of those were because there were uh, mentions of the Russian nobility, rich men uh, built before World War I. After uh, Bolshevik Revolution, they were transformed for, in the housings of the Soviet nomenclatura, right? And again, when Romanians came, they gave part of it to their own kind of um, officials, but also, but also they gave those to, to, um, um, Roman, uh, to the Odessan cultural intelligentsia. And we see here one of those uh, famous boulevard, which was kind of a visit card, a, a facade of Romanian rule. They were very proud of it. Odessa was an exception among the other cities of Eastern Front because he, for example, other occupied Ukrainian cities, were run down by the Germans. There was no cultural life. He didn't want to allow any cultural life. Uh, in the, he, he hated uh, Slavic cities, right? But Romanians didn't have this attitude. They allowed it, and they were some very proud of it. We shall see some of other pictures which kind of show other aspects of Romanian rule. Let us move further on. This is one of many uh, black markets, or if you will, flea markets in Odessa. There's a lot of, um, see, when Jews were deported from Odessa, or many of them fled from Odessa, their properties were plundered by their neighbors, right? And then they sold many of those things. When Jews were killed by the Germans, by the Romanians, uh, they distributed the things that they took, like costumes, like clothing. Because it's it, 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 the war, people were impoverished. And then they, they sold these things on the market. And then there were, of course, these German settlers who brought their agricultural products to this. So um, there were a lot of these things. But we think of these markets as actually very chaotic, kind of shameful places. But for the people who live through the depredation of the Soviet rule, there were signs of the returning normality to some extent. Let me think of it, how contradictory and how um, multifaceted all of this was. How people were, uh, many, that's, that's another picture, you see the same basically story told here. How much of that was, uh, was basically kind of morally painted what they were doing and nevertheless they're just concentrating on their sheer survival under the conditions were increasingly Hmm. Yeah, let's go further. Um, this is the picture which come from the city of um, Tiraspol, uh, which was the second most important city in Transnistria. There was the Soviet era theater, uh, was an Ukrainian theater. Um, while Romanians respected Russian language um, kind of um, how do you say, cosmopolitan um, air in Odessa, they hated anything which was Ukrainian. For them, Ukrainian was a symbol of backwardness, of um, dirtiness, um, and they transformed anything Ukrainian into the uh, Romanian stuff. So they closed uh, Ukrainian theater in Odessa and transformed it in the uh, national theater. And the same they did in Trust. <laughs> so instead of Ukrainian, we have Teatral National, which means, of course, Romanian National Theatre. Uh, and that is, of course, a very ugly aspect of, of Romanian rule. Okay, let's go further. Um, see, one of the aspects of Romanian rule was that they found those um, ethnic Romanian villages. They were not many. They expected to find much more, right? And they wanted to nationalize them. These people didn't think of themselves as Romanian spoke a um, dialect of Romanian called Moldovan, but Romanian authorities wanted to make them fully Romanian. And one of the ways they, uh, they, they did it, they organized this trip 
of Moldovan students into Romania to show them the best aspects of Romania. What we see here, such group of girls arriving in Bucharest, and they led by, by this uh, co collaborators of this uh, Council of Patronage um, to their destinations, maybe, right? And all of this is very kind of middle class. They show there's a good costumes, all of them are very, very uh, well behaved, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This is the image of their cultural activity they wanted to produce, right? Let us go still further. And this is uh, the guys who were the leaders. I don't want to give their names, uh, but those were the leaders of this um, Moldovan um, uh, communities, uh, self-appointed leaders. Some of them immigrated, most of them immigrated to, to Romania during the, uh, during the Russian Civil War, uh, lived there in Romania, not fully integrated, um, supported by the government for political reasons. And then they were kind of re exported to Transnistria with the Romanian troops, trying to organize local Moldovans there. I think much came out of it because these people themselves, these um, ethnic Romanian emigrants from Transnistria who came back from Romania, um, they were uh, really not nice characters. They constantly fought against one another and eventually they were arrested and um, expelled from Transnistria by the governor who suspected them of separatist activities, which probably was a misunderstanding, but it still shows how ineffectual uh, those attempts were. Okay, let us go further. Uh, here we see um, Romanians um, actually uh, convoying Jews to the ghettos. We don't know exactly the place, but you know what's happening. Okay, let's go further. One of the uh, many gallows which reconstructed it as a following the um, explosion at the Romanian military headquarters on the 22nd uh, of October 1941, to which Romanians responded by uh, the service of repressions. One of them was just hanging Jews, any Jews they could put their hands on because they suspected all Jews were communists, but they just hanged them on the streets over there. So you see here, Romanian soldiers. Or maybe it's undone looking away. Such gallows, according to um, the description of the eyewitnesses, uh, were standing in many places over this. They were removed in a couple of days. This is one of the, or maybe the only surviving order. Wow. This is another awful, uh, awful order. It shows the um, Metropolitan Visarium Guru visiting a court at this. This is probably also comes from uh, the collection um, of pictures uh, taken by the um, Army Department of Propaganda. And what we see here, Metropolitan and some other officials visiting what uh, the uh, caption says, visiting the uh, camp of Bolsheviks. In fact, those were most of them probably just um, Russian Soviet um, prisons of war. What we see here, some of them uh, are wearing either barefooted or wearing uh, this uh, very primitive um, uh, birch bark shoes called lapti, basically mm. the most primitive uh, you can imagine. Maybe some of them were actually suspected communists, suspected partisans. And um, why exactly the uh, 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 Metropolitan decided to visit them, we don't know. But we see here really people who are despondent, who are frightened, who are fearful. And, then, uh, and, and this we see here also the governor, actually, right? And the metropolitan and why they visited what is the point we don't know but mm. it really looks quite kind of horrifying picture because the priest should be bringing consolation to these people but he's surrounded by the military authorities and he is kind of almost like the main figure here why exactly all of this is happening 
something is wrong with this picture, definitely. Let's go further. And you chose that one for the cover of your book. So it, it obviously to you, it yeah. symbolizes everything you want it to symbolize. So important. Well, it's not everything, but this is the governor's was choice. And I kind of agree with it because I think mm. it's a picture which is poses so many questions, right? Let's yeah. move to the next one. Uh, this is a picture which shows how the metropolitan, he is here in the center, right? Uh, uh, has been, uh, well, actually not, was mad uh, at the entrance of a village. So he travels through with the, like in the missionary activity through the villages of Transistia to the huge group of people and look at their legs, they're barefoot. Mm. They're really so poor, they don't have anything of their feet, right? And he's uh, one of the uh, so-called so soft horse, Soviet, Soviet state-owned farms, just transformed by Romanian uh, state in a Romanian state-owned farm, right? Uh, this is actually very close to this. The Dalnik, the village Dalnik, was notorious because here. Romanians expelled to this place. A lot of Jews from Odessa right? before this explosion of the 22nd and, and shortly afterwards. And in one of those places, one of those barracks um, took place, those executions. We don't know whether this, this is taken before. No, I think it's probably later. And this is the other barracks. But in some of the barracks, maybe two, 5,000 people were murdered in the most barbaric way, both by shooting and by burning alive. Oh. Right. And then from that place, people were then deported from other de to other destinations in Transnistria. Most of them, they were murdered there too. So Dalnik is one of those awful places. Unfortunately, it now kind of became integrated into the city of Odessa, and there is I don't think there is anything reminding people what actually happened. Uh, that, that's, that's one of those uh, very um, regretful aspects of mm. how the Soviets manipulated the memory, how they didn't want to tell the real story, and how kind of people forgot and don't care about much of what happened during this time. We still need to restore. And there's some history. So I, I wrote yeah. about it. Still right, right? But it's mostly Ukrainian uh, historians who need to do the job. Uh, when Soviets retreated, uh, they blew up a dam, right? Um, there is another word for this, a dike, one can say, right? Which um, kind of what kept water from um, flooding into some of the low running descent. Uh, uh, districts, and um, this is how this district was flooded. One of those districts. Um, then uh, Romanians, uh, Romanians eliminate, um, pump water out, and destroy the dike. We shall now see the picture of people who have that. Okay, let's go from. See, this is the Soviet era engineers who volunteered to restore the dam, to destroy the dike, and to um, pump water out from this flooded district. Right, because they were all, from the Soviet point of view, helpers of the enemy. But in fact, they were probably just helping the local population. Soviet watch the edge policy was, of course, uh, very brutal to the population, which was mm. left behind the um, front line in the occupied territory. Oh, this is another picture. This is the guy whose um, name was Valentsov, Badaev. Uh, uh, Molotov. He was a KGB officer from Russia, the rank of mayor, major, sorry, major, <laughs> not mayor. Uh, yeah, I, I said it in Romanian. So, um, a major, and um, uh, he was sent with a mission to organize the sabotage groups behind the Romanian line. Um, so initially, guerrilla groups that the Soviets created were supposed to operate from uh, the so-called catacombs in the desert that were basically queries from which uh, since the time Odessa rose uh, as an important um, city on the Black Sea, they used to query stone for building. And um, it was a chaotic process. So as a result, there appeared this labyrinth 
of queries, but sometimes connecting, disconnecting. Um, Soviets, before the Soviets, there was the criminals who used them. <laughs> and then the Soviets decided to use them for guerrilla activity. They created these groups. One of the group was held by this guy. They don't know what exactly they did. Soviet missiles showed that they did this and that. They blew up trains. I didn't find evidence of anything of this of the Romanian sources. So I, I am very skeptical about the Soviet largest than life uh, accounts. Uh, but he was he was uh, hard not to crack, right? So to say, he was fanatical Stalinist. He he uh, was there in, in the catacombs as long as he could, much longer than they initially planned. He was eventually captured, arrested due to the betrayal, but he behaved heroically during the trial, was executed by the Romanians, right? never um, expressing any regret as to his activity. And this is the picture of kind of perfect Stalinist from the Soviet point of view, perfect communist. On the other hand, it's amazing. He's with his kids, right? He was an NKVD officer. Probably his hands was blooded with the blood of uh, innocent victims, but he was also a tough soldier. He voted to the course. Uh, one of those kind of figures, which is so difficult, is so difficult to read. Hmm. Uh, Commit, committed to his ideology. Uh, yeah, but also a patriot, right? He fought for hmm. his country to the last drop of his blood and um you know it looks like in this particular case or this firmness uh, is confirmed by the by the romanian sources and the, the, this hardness and his devotion to his country right mm -hmm. and self-abnegation this confirmed by the, uh, he didn't achieve much but he fought to the last right mm -hmm. and that's yeah and this is the photo uh, which I'm not even sure that it's authentic, but they gave me it to me. But in the uh, Museum of uh, Regional History in Odessa, City and Regional History, and um, this is a photo supposedly of somebody called Petrovsky, who was the head of the underground party Opcom. Why does he look here? This day? it's very strange. So he, he was then after the war, arrested by the NKVD and executed as a traitor. And, but the account is, but then he was rehabilitated. And the account of his activity is so contradictory. He was arrested by the Romanians, released, rearrested. Was he really ten code? Was he really somebody who was trying to the best of his abilities, as he claimed? To deceive the enemy, but then recreate this um, network of underground organizations. We don't know. Um, his record was really tragic. Whatever he did, he didn't achieve much of anything and might have contributed to the destruction of the network of underground groups, whether by design or by default, we don't know. But this picture, if it is real, because the guys who gave it to me claim the members of his own family brought it this picture is known, and if this guy is really the first secretary of the underground party OPCOM, OPCOM is the regional party committee, uh, it does convey this image of um, kind of a double agents of kind of a man with two faces. It's not how you would expect Soviet um, uh, apparatchik look like. What is going on here? It's really a very disturbing picture. Uh, other picture we don't have. Hmm. Soviets didn't want to keep pictures of people whom they suspected. Right? And, and is, it, is it generally difficult to research people, figures from this era, because they may have been written about Romanian history, Soviet historians, Soviet historians after the war, Romanian historians during communism, Romanian historians after communism, I'm guessing that if you research some of these figures, depending on when they were written about, it's a different story. No, I think the Soviet, uh, Romanians didn't write about them because uh, they didn't want 
during the communist era, this period was trouble. Forget it, yeah. Um, Soviets wrote a lot, but this is both basically mythology. We, we can dismiss it as a rubbish, all of it. So we need to go to the primary sources, but unfortunately access to the primary sources in Russia is impossible. In Ukraine, when I worked here, Sometime I will give us some of the very interesting materials in the um, former KGB, so it's now Service of State Security Archive. Sometimes it was denied. It, it seems to be very random and kind of uh, unsystematic. There is no consistency, mm. right? Um, I think only when the archives will be fully open, we will would be able to, to write this history. Unfortunately, till now we have bits and pieces. Some of them are very interesting. You know more than during the Soviet time. We can reconstruct it, but there is still remains many kind of lacuna. We don't know what happened, right? And uh, even if we, we have a lot of they they are self contradictory. We can't really figure out what was going on. This is the guy who uh, was, uh, in fact, um, Petrovsky's um, superior before the withdrawal of the Soviets, who came back as the first secretary of the Sapasi Committee and immediately ordered the arrest of Petrovsky, his execution as a traitor. Well, later on, when he was removed from this position of authority, they claimed that the guy himself wanted to erase the traces of his own incompetence, how he prepared this letter. To what extent any of this is true is basically impossible to say because on each occasion those decisions seem to have been politically motivated by the party. And um, um, well, we still don't have access to some of the most important materials to actually figure out what was going on. But it, even without that, we, we now understand how tragic all of this was. Mm. Soviets wanted to impose this kind of black and white narrative, good guys, bad guys. But during the occupation, people had to make a lot of compromises, a lot of compromises to survive, to, to adjust, to do this and that. And many of them adapted different personas during this period. Yeah, They changed their personas, their political identities. One of the processes that I traced was this, there were Ukrainian nationals who wanted to fight for Ukrainian national state. But when the tide of war changed, they understood that the Soviets coming back, they presented themselves as Soviet partisans. <laughs> so, see, it's a story with so many shades, nuances. It's a fascinating story, but very difficult to reconstruct. Because yeah. after the war, people wanted to claim that they always had one particular identity. They never hesitated. They were always good Soviet guys. Obviously, one can understand they were very invested in this stuff. It, what you're saying, Vladimir, is very familiar because myself living in France, looking at France's understanding of its past, this is the process France has been through over the last 70 to 80 years of the of, of what their individual roles were in the war and, and this line between resistance, collaboration, survival. And France has pretty much accepted everything now. They're pretty open about it now. They There are programs on the, on, t on television all the time about the Malice and the gendarmerie and the collaboration. But it seems to me, with my limited knowledge, while I've learned a lot this week, Romania hasn't kind of, and indeed moving into the other countries nearby, Hungary, Ukraine, haven't really kind of come to terms and, and understood their, their true role in the war yet. That's true, but... This part that I'm talking probably more like Ukrainian history because these guys were Soviet, you know, officials, Ukrainian officials, Soviet Ukrainian officials, and they also don't very much want to know hmm. right now. They still, well, I feel that I hope my book cont contributes to that. Unfortunately, I was not able to find a publisher in Ukraine that's a Romanians published my book very quickly and it has very positive echoes, but I could not find a publisher in, in Ukraine who would take the book. I think they probably just don't understand still what I did, what, what the book is about and how it is an important part of their own history. And I'm sure it would find the readership after the war, hopefully the war would end to come to a man. Um, so by telling these complicated stories, I kind of help people 
maybe um, grasp, right? Yeah. Um, the incredible complexity of what their own uh, history is consists of, right? Yeah. So yeah. Many strands, many nuances, as I said, many shades of of, of gray and other colors. And no, it's definitely. not um, heroes and traitors on you yeah, can't count much more story in this kind. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I read I recently this wonderful book by Philippe Buren um, about French under the Germans, mm. right? It, it's a French historian translated in English. And um, in, it does tell us these incredibly diff difficult stories of how people try to make sense, to adjust, to preserve their humanity, just to survive, right? Yeah. And to present their dignity, dignity, yeah. dignity, dignity in this. And sometimes they overstepped it. Sometimes uh, they just lost themselves in this tremendous upheaval in their lives, yeah. right? But when I when I had Dr. Chris Millington on, Vladimir. Which was, because the history, preceding history was so much more tragic. Yeah. When I had Dr. Chris Millington on talking about France, Vladimir, he was saying that we're burdened by the words resistance and collaboration. He prefers the word defiance and accommodation. We need to kind of redefine our language so that we, because these words are so so burdened with, with maybe false understandings of what they mean. Exactly. I completely agree. Uh, and they are not adequate enough. So that's why this Buran, he adopted the um, adjustment, he's saying, not necessarily collaboration, not exclusion, something is in between them. That yeah. was the attitude of more French, he, he claims. And I think it was also true about the occupied Transnistria. People just wanted to survive, right? But sometimes they want to collaborate too because they hated Soviets. And sometimes yeah. this desire to collaborate would bring them to actually committing war crimes or justifying war crimes. Yeah. No, definitely. So survival seems to be the, the word that is forgotten so often is people who have no other means, people at the bottom end of yeah. society, their primary, often their primary goal is just to keep them and their families alive. And they kind of follow the prevailing winds in a decision that is, is all about not selfish, but it's it's family first. And, and, and that I think everybody can have an understanding of that. It's of an yeah. empathy. To that. That, yes. yeah. yeah. So let's move to the images. But this is one, this is Bragarenka, the engineer Bragarenka, who was a, a, a teacher and a kind of associate professor, I would say, at the University of uh, Odessa. He was Jew, she was Jewish, but then she had she hide his Jewishness. And on her own, apparently on her own, tried to organize a cell of resistance. In Transnistria, was caught and executed. This is uh, the picture which is coming from Romanian investigating. That's why, that's why the quality is not is not particularly good. But so it didn't trust her because apparently he, she didn't have authorization to create it. Or maybe she had it from Petrovsky, whom they executed as a traitor. Uh, but we know that she did succeed until Romanians finally caught her and executed. One of the problems is the idea of creating the network of uh, underground cells was they were supposed to be centralized under party control. And once you create something which is centralized, it's easy to penetrate, right? And to destroy. And this is exactly what happened. This in, in the spring of 1943, there was a wave of arrests and executions. You see, this was also one of the aspects of Romanian repressions of, uh, of these uh, partisan groups that. There were uh, martial courts, right? Court marshals. They were supposed to try uh, people for uh, state crimes according to the code of military jurisdiction. But when Romanian gendarmes would apprehend these guys, arrest them and bring them, quite often the magistrates would release them saying, not enough evidence, we can't judge them. You know what happened? Gendarmes would supposedly convoy them back to the places of their residence and they would murder them, shoot them in the back, writing reports short about trying to escape from the escort. And it was the massive, massive phenomenon. 
massive. Uh, the, mm-hmm. the, the archives are full of those reports, right? And she was she was murdered in this way. It was not really an execution, because execution is something according to the law. Yeah. Uh, it was an extra legal repression. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people were repressed in this way. Really awful story. Mm-hmm. The, this is something which raises the question, and that's something that is painful, whether Romanian gendarmerie was actually a criminal organization as a whole. Mm. Because so many crimes were committed by people who supposedly were put there to ensure the implement application of the law, and they were committing crimes themselves on the basis of verbal order, which were illegal, and which Romanian law said was a crime to implement. Because Romanian law was very developed. It said the issues of a criminal order is a crime, but the implementation of the criminal order is the crime equally and punish them by the same punishment. And they still carried those orders out with very few exceptions. So what does it tell us about the organization which is supposed is there to ensure the law and then violates it routinely? Hmm. Okay. That really raises this this painful question. The yeah. same was was true about the army, but uh, I think Gendarmerie was involved in a more routine manner, and um, that's a painful question. They need to answer it, Romanians, and one and one point in time. I looked at the um, manuals uh, of um, uh, history of the Gendarmerie that the, the uh, students in the institutions which train. Uh, future gendarmes in Romania, because this institution still exists. And of course, there is not a word about that. Not a word. They don't want to know anything. But they need to. They need to. Right? And what's this okay. photo here, Vladimir? This is a group of, of other this young people, see, especially younger people, uh, people who were schooled in the Soviet schools, right? In this ideology of Stalinism, devotion to the Soviet. They were part- particularly um, kind of prone to Soviet propaganda during the war. And many of them joined this cell again because they were so well idealistic and naive. They were easy prey for Ajahn provocateurs, which were planted among them. And I recorded and executed many of them all over Transnistria, all over Transnistria. The, the archives are full of this story. Let's go further. Well, <laughs> this is, see, this is a typical Ukrainian heart of this period. You see how primitive the conditions were? And this is supposedly where the heart in, in which the, um, the cell in the village of Krimka, uh, which later was kind of mythologized in the Soviet period, there was a novel written, a film made, I tried to watch this film. It's impossible to watch because it's so bad, right? It's a typical Soviet uh, storied lie, right? One after another. They blew the trains, they killed a lot of people. Nothing of this was true. Their lives were in vain. They just created these stupid cells, were talking some kind of nonsense. Something happened among them. It's a very, very kind of obscure story. Somebody turned uh, this, this, then. Eventually, all of them were caught and murdered, accomplishing nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. About 30 people, young people, right? Stupid, naive, comfortable members. Hmm. And look at that. What life did they live? What kind of life was that? This was the reality of, of this in the Soviet villages during the Stalin's rule. It was misery. Poverty everywhere, right? People barefoot, right? And then ending life in this way. One cannot read this story without really um, not being deeply touched by such horror. It seems to me to understand this this era, you have to be a, 
understand the military side of things, the social side of things, the cultural side of things, the long term history. There's so many elements to this to understand it, because myself, you know, growing up near London, trying to understand how life was for people in this area in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, it's, it's hard to relate to. Absolutely. It, it, it's very hard. The life that they live, their experience is so different from ours. Hmm. Although, of course, people who live in today's Ukraine in this same area, they probably they, they probably have an idea. Yeah, yeah. Nice. right? The hmm. horror coming. The oh, terrible. Well, yes. this is our last slide, Vladimir. So, yes, um, our slide. This is Soviet army man posing in front of the very well-known monument. In fact, this is a monument you won't believe believe it to Duke de Richelieu. It was the distant relative of that same Cardinal Richelieu. All right. You know why? Because he fled to Russia during the French Revolution, entered the Russian civil service, he was appointed governor of the region, which was known at the time as the New Russia, and his um, uh, residence was in Ukraine. When Napoleon was and this is unbelievable. Listen, Paul, this is unbelievable. When Napoleon was defeated, he returned to France and was one time prime minister in the restoration period. But he loved Odessa so much that he constantly inquired in his private correspondence about the state in Odessa and about the harvests in this area and how the weather affected it. He's very popular, Odessa. This monument to him where he's presented as a um, Roman senator in, in this toga, right? Is the place for dating, like the, the pairs of young people meet here. And here we see a red army man, right? All of them young, 44, holding in front of this. Um, they, uh, in Odessa, this monument is known as simply a duke. They call it duke. Let's go to duke. Let's meet at the Duke, right? Um, April 44, maybe a day after the Odessa is liberated, new life starts, new era starts, not necessarily good mm. in all this aspect. Because after that, in 46, 47, Ukraine and this region in particular was again hit by famine. Horrible. Um, maybe. Well, certainly less than a whole lot of more people died, but hundreds of thousands people died. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I'm thinking now is that I'm, when I do some shows on this channel and it ends in 1944 or 1945, it, it truly closes a chapter. The, the tragedy of this region is this is just the finishing of one chapter, then the next chapter is also crap, and the next one, the next one, and now we're in another chapter of, of misery. So... To bring things to an end, Vladimir, in terms of studying the past, you've hinted at this during the show there, but what what are you hoping for the next generation of historians? Because you've been doing this for 30 or 40 years now. So what beyond the current war, where where do you hope this history and understanding goes? Well, I don't know. I hope Ukraine would prevail. Would it become an independent country? Of course, for a long time, their attention would be focused on this war, the current war. Yeah. It's inevitable. This current war would change their perception on the past, on their identity, on their relations with Russia, on who they are, on World War II. You know, in the Soviet parlance, World War II is referred to as the Great Patriotic War. Yeah. Now, Ukrainians refer to the current war as a patriotic war. The Chisnina Vina. And see, it would overshadow everything else. Absolutely. When they <laughs> return to the study of World War II, when they've been capable of grasping all of this, when they would become interested in it, I don't really know. Mm. I, I, unfortunately, the current tragedy is so massive that in comparison with it, almost nothing. Yeah. Mm. I understand it perfectly. It's also a shock because 
you know, this is a Russian speaking city. It has been and largely remains being attacked by those whom they considered like themselves. What could be more awful than that? You know? But think of it. Just put yourself in these shoes. Your own brothers come and kill you and bomb you. How would you even process it? Mm. How would you even begin to understand it, to make sense of it? Yeah. No, I mean, uh, it, I think emotionally, this is the shock that um, will last forever. They will have reverberations for years and years and years and years. To come. And, mm. and I thought of uh, World War II as the last war Ukraine fought. And now, guess what? The idiot in Kremlin unleashed a new one. Yeah. A new Hitler is there, right? A new Hitler. He's dividing families, killing people, sending millions of people as refugees out of, of Ukraine, destroying Ukrainian infrastructure, right? Uh, I have no words. I can't, I can't, I can't approach this. I don't know. How can that be? Why is this? How could Russians let themselves be deceived by such evil man? An evil man. And also a crazed one, a madman. Right? I think in terms of 19th century version of Russian imperial nationalistic history, but he has nothing besides it in himself. No vision, no anything. So, this is a story which, uh, of course, will leave in infamy. That, that's for sure. Infamy yeah. for Russians, but also in glory for Ukraine, Ukrainians, right? Uh, and I don't know whether the even, how will the world look like after this war? How far Putin will go? Nobody knows anything right now. So talking about when they will return to the study of World War II, it looks like, unfortunately, all of this is not on their agenda anymore. It will not be for a long time. Mm. Um, that is bad. I think this war also would uh, create, make it impossible to see nuances because the war make people like good guys and bad guys. They, they, return, they refer now to Russians as orcs. They dehumanize them. It's probably Russians need to dehumanize Ukrainians. I don't know. Um, actually, I don't care about what Russians do because um, I more, care more what the Ukrainians do. Yeah, no, and definitely. of course, for Ukrainians, it, it's black and white. We are together against the evil incarnate. And that's true. That's true. They are against the evil incarnate. Against, against this background, nothing matters. And because of this, I think kind of even my own research too. I, I feel I'm now working on this part of the prosecution of women and I, and I feel like, gosh, I can't take my mind off from what is going on. Can't. I, I need to return almost like you every, if not minute, and at least one half an hour, and look for the news. And I feel like, what exactly am I doing? Well, yeah. this is happening, you know? I no, I, 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 feel, I feel the same. I've wondered whether or not I should continue doing programming about World War II during the middle of a current war. I've, I've had these pangs of conscious thing. Is, is, it, is it appropriate to be talking about the events of 80 years ago when there's similar things happening today? And then the other part of me thinks, because, but surely dialogue is good, especially on a YouTube where it's international dialogue. The great thing about this is there are people watching this who are in Romania and Ukraine and America and Canada and Britain and if we if we discuss the past, I like to think it'll help us understand the future. Uh, that's maybe a naive bit of optimism there, but that's kind of what I hope is that dialogue is always a good thing. Discussion is always positive. That's true, but think of it. It's like, what if we are like people who in '39 discussed this story of World War One, but feeling that the new world war is coming? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, historians work on the things 
which are forgotten and very constructive what happened a long time ago. But this is relevant only in a peaceful time when people can concentrate on something different from the immediate future. Right? Yeah. How could you how could you think about World War II if World War Three can start? Well, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope yeah, I hope I, it I, won't. I, but when you I have think... a madman with his finger on, on, on the nuclear button. To me, it's just about trying to understand how deeply rooted ideology is, how how propaganda is still part of our lives. We think of these themes from World War II as the power of imagery, the power of people following a course, and the fact is they're still just as prevalent. That's, true. As, That's so a very good. Mm -hmm. It's it's That's trying to understand good. the mechanisms, I suppose. But we'll bring things to the end, yeah. Vladimir, because otherwise we, I'm going to get all more, uh, you know, depressed and and go and watch the news. Well, you know, let me let me just say one thing. See. If, you actually hinted at something which is probably central. Uh, see, the version of World War II, which is taught in Russia, right, which Russians believe is very primitive, right? And mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons why this awfully crude propaganda that had been fed to them actually had an echo in the Russian society. Russian identity is very much present in it, formed by, not by the memory of World War II, but what they believe is the memory of World War II. By Soviet mythology, us versus them, the air attack, very alone, surrounded by enemies, stuff like that. And had they been taught more nuanced history, maybe they would make them capable of critical thinking, and appreciating, you know, div diversity, right? Now they, the, the people who are the victims of Putin's propaganda, and there are many of them in Russia, they are incapable of uh, thinking of for nuances, right? Of critical thinking at all. It's important. History is very important. Although in the base, uh, which are um, uh, not immediately obvious, uh, the good history, I believe, makes bad propaganda. <laughs> and that's very good. It undermines propaganda. Any propaganda it undermines. It shows how much more complex the world is. Yeah. How your side is not always right. Make you think. And if people are exposed to these crude versions of their national histories, they are perfect praise for crude nationalistic warlike propaganda that's what happened in today's russia you can't imagine what nonsense this russian propagandists protest propagandists are feeding to their people in which they believe unfortunately i have this tragedy in my own family believe me or not some of them living in ukraine are ukrainian side those who live in moldova are very much pray pray to the russian propaganda strange though it might be it's awful. I can't talk to my mom. Well, right? and and I and I and I and I call my distant relatives in Ukraine, and I just can and I just weep with them. What else can I do? Yeah. The whole families are in these territorial um, defense units. Women, men, whole families, even all. People try to do something, even those with cancer on chemo, trying to do something to, to, to help defenders, right? And another family, you have those who have what put in. That's, that's what we, we arrived at. It's just my family. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I understand my family doesn't matter. But that's the reality in which we live. The propaganda transformed people in, um, well, Nazis. They yeah. say they want to not denazify Ukraine. They're Nazis themselves. You, you hit you hit something there. We've all got to learn and and keep on improving our critical thinking. That's that's the key to understanding right. is to, to not absolutely not, that's not, how we understand it. Not that we must all start believing conspiracy theories. You can take these yes. things too far, but at the same time, when we are confronted with whether it's media or history, mm -hmm. is to 
is to understand that someone's trying to tell us something. Why are they trying to tell us this? And and mm -hmm. challenge ourselves to to, mm -hmm. to make sure we we are critical of it. Mm -hmm. I think history is very good at helping people become more sophisticated consumers of information. Yeah, because they help them read the texts which come from different people, different situations, and kind of make sense of them. Yeah, beyond the immediate what is on the surface, put them in the context, understand the relations with other texts, right? Right. And this, this is a skill which is extremely important. But unfortunately, again, if you have had a very primitive, crude, nationalistic version of your own history, and I'm not so talking, I'm just talking about anybody, right? And then you're a perfect prey for state propaganda. Yeah. Perfect. In the Soviet Union, history was used for what they called patriotic education. And in today's Russia too, patriotic education equal history. What kind of history is this? It's not history. It's shame on you, right? Mm -hmm. But this is how they taught historians to be. We are there to support the government. We are there, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's just the opposite. Historians should do the opposite. They should question, reconstruct the past and it's so complex. It's incredibly difficult, but it's, it also so fascinating the past. I really love doing it, except that today, of course, my mind is fixed on something infinitely more tragic. Well, not it's 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 also tragic was back then. No, I can't say that. But infinitely more relevant. Relevant is the word. I was going to say relevant is the word, isn't it? The the tragedy of World War Two is always going to be a tragedy, but it is thankfully in the past. But but current tragedies may be on a smaller scale, but they're more relevant. Uh, so that's a. But we, we will we'll bring things to an end, Vladimir. Huh? We'll look. World War Two was was not necessary, right? There was just one madman who made it. it it's clear like that. One madman take the guy away would be no World War Two. That's World War One was more complex thing, kind of everybody contributed, you know, it's his own crazy way. But World War Two, take Hitler away, no World War II, period. And what is happening in today's Ukraine and what might be the longer term consequence is the result of one crazed man. Period. Yeah, very true. And what sense can we make of it? There is no sense. There is no sense. There is no wider meaning. How can we deal with this, with this situation when millions are affected by the craziness of one, one man, very bad man? Mm. There is no progress, though there is nothing. There's pure contingency. It's like playing victim to a serial killer. Why he's killing, he doesn't even know why he's killing, but he does. He is killing. Yeah. Oh. Well, I think, well, let's, let's bring things. It's been absolutely amazing talking to you, Vladimir, and I would love to have you come back on when you've completed the next book that touches more on the Holocaust side of things. Oh. Brilliant. Well, I'll just, I'll just remind you what we're coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, uh, this brings this part of Romania at war uh, week to an end. Tomorrow we've got a unique show about the, the escape of M General MacArthur from Corregidor and the Philippines in 1942 and then next week, we well, we've got shows on Saturday show it, Thailand on Saturday and then Alex Kershaw on Sunday so it just keeps on going until I have a few days off because I'm going back to England for the first time in two years uh, next week so that'll be really cool. So if you're new to the channel don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to uh, check us out on Patreon, Patreon or become a YouTube member. As I said at the beginning of the show, the link to uh, Dr. Solanari's book is in the description below. So please consider getting that to, to in, arm yourself with more information about this fascinating occupation of Transnistria. But now it just remains for me to say thank you very much to Vladimir for joining us. Um, thank you. And it's been great. Um, tragic, tragic I story. It. But it's been it's been list great to talk to you. So this is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying I'll see you all again tomorrow evening. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye.